Hi, I'm Ed Sperling. I'm the Editor-in-Chief of Semiconductor Engineering. I'm over at Axiom Eyes with Ashish Darbari. We're going to talk today about using formal for RISC V security. Ashish, what are we actually looking for when we talk about security in RISC V and formal? Sure. So edge security is quite a complex topic as you know, it means different things to different people. But if I was to simplify it in one simple word, it would be CIA, uh, which is confidentiality, integrity, and availability. So, so long as we can ensure that all hardware designs preserve these three axioms of confidentiality, access, integrity, and availability, then everything is secure. So how does this actually work? So the way it works for processors is we go for understanding the architecture of the processor. And based on the architecture, we now know what aspects of confidentiality, integrity, and availability are important for us to capture. And also want to make sure that the microarchitecture implementation does not defeat the purpose of the architecture in the first place. So by using formal methods in general, we can go a lot further than normally you can with any of the test-based or simulation-based approaches. And uh, there are loads of ways of doing this through uh, using model checking tools, theorem proving tools, writing good formal properties. Let's dig into this. Sure. Ashish, what are we looking at? So what we're looking at, Ed, is the interplay of different verification concerns that we need to be aware of. So one, on the one hand, we have architectural features such as the ISA, most notably for processors. And then you have the microarchitecture implementation. And the way these things overlap is that if you have bugs in the microarchitecture, they can impact the architecture. But at the same time, microarchitecture implementations can affect power performance in area. So there's a big overlap between these two. And if I go further and look at the other verification aspects that are making life harder for us, safety, security are becoming a big nightmare for most of the silicon houses. So if you have an issue in a microarchitecture implementation with X, for example, which may have been used to enhance power, it can actually cause security issues. It can actually cause deadlock and live lock. Similarly, you can actually have architectural vulnerabilities and faults in the architecture model that can actually cause deadlock and live lock to happen as well. So this diagram actually shows how these verification concerns overlap with each other. This is not a static model though, right? Because your microarchitecture is going to change, you're going to have software updates. Each one of these is going to be very different design from the next one. Yes. How does that all work? Yes, excellent, yes. So I didn't bring software into it, but as we know, the software is the thing that drives the hardware and, and the firmware also becomes very important in this discussion. But because we are looking at hardware verification from sort of formal point of view at this point of time, I've laid these things out. So if you bring in software and you want to talk about software for custom instructions, for example, in the context of RISC-V, it becomes really useful. Then these things become even more interesting. So if you bring in a layer of extensions that could actually come in the design, all of these issues get much more complex because for the ISA, the, the, there is a RISC-5 international uh, body of very smart people who develop these things. So they pay attention to understanding that you don't develop inconsistent instructions. And generally, the architecture is quite clean, logically. But if you start bringing in custom instructions, that's where things go really, really pear-shaped quite fast. And we've been looking at a number of designs where these things are becoming more and more apparent in the way that uh, the goals of making secure verification a reality are sort of impacted in a negative way. A lot of what is being done to, to track security is using tests, right? Mm, correct, I, yeah, that's right. Because we inherited this from 80s test-based approach. And actually what happens here is, for example, if I'm testing an AND instruction uh, or an ADD instruction, what typically happens in a test-based approach is you switch off all of the side um, you know, uh, disturbances as it were. So you switch off exceptions, you switch off interrupts, debug, and you start sending what is called a vanilla test case where you say, oh, if I do an AND or an ADD one after the other, does the processor work correctly? And these are things that typically people have been doing it for years. 
as a way to bring up a processor, you know, assembly-based testing. And then you can randomize these, these things as well. But then if you start randomizing the order in which you do these things, you still are limited by the number of permutations that actually you can test meaningfully. And this is only if you were looking at ISA testing without extensions, without security. If you start to bring in those into the purview, then it gets really hard. And I just wanted to outline this. So if you imagine regular instructions, then you happen to have security enhanced instructions. And then if you do a cross with interrupts, debug, you talk about stall, you talk about exceptions. And if you consider the permutation combination of these, it's actually a lot of scenarios to consider, and it's not even a meaningful problem from the point of view of ensuring rigor. And that's basically the limitation of test space or any simulation-based technique, and that's why I think formal is a great way of, of looking at security. How does this look in the real world? What are you actually working with? Well, great question. So what we've been doing in Axiomize is we have this formalizer app that uh, we have built over the years and integrated over a dozen cores. And we every time a new core comes out in the open source domain, we complete the integration in our app. And about three to four weeks ago, we started integrating uh, the famous Cherry OT IBEX core, which is actually quite a nice core because it now showcases for the first time how you can actually avoid memory safety issues by using the capability enhanced Cherry instructions on top of the regular RISC V instructions. And what is remarkable about this design is that the one that we're looking at, the Cherry OT IPEX, is the implementation of IPEX score. It's been augmented for security with the Cherry instructions, and it's going to be used for IoT applications. So you can imagine it really does need to be a lot secure because of the way it will be used in connected devices. So what we have found is that, so I started to know about Cherry uh, about four or five months ago, and I thought I'll put this on our roadmap. What we've seen is that you have these regular instructions, which come from the RISC-5 foundation, and then you have the Cherry instructions which talk about how we can use a secure load or a secure store. And as soon as we integrated the processor in the app, very quickly we found that the properties that we have written in formal for testing all of the correctness for the regular RISC-5 instruction set. So we didn't even start checking for the security implementation. We were just looking at checking that the processor works correctly despite the security instructions being in place. And we found a very interesting corner case pretty much within seconds of running the app. And what it was is that if you have an illegal exception that comes because you have issued a cherry load, but it happens to be illegal, all illegal instructions should be trapped and they should be killed in the pipe. They should not be allowed to execute and they should certainly not be allowed to affect the regular execution. In this case, the illegal cherry load was able to be issued and executed, so it made its way across the core to the memory. It went and picked up the value from the memory, and it then brought that value back to the registers and actually prevented and corrupted the regular R-type instructions. So none of the R-type instructions could actually work correctly because now you have a security feature built into the processor which actually prevents the processor from working correctly in the first place. So this was quite odd because these implementations have been verified by numerous teams before with simulation and formal. Really what you're dealing with then is, is just incredible complexity and just keeps getting more and more complex as you go forward, right? So yeah, so what's what's happening at is we have actually got no visibility of the microarchitecture. We don't go read the design. So what we've actually said is ask the most important architectural question is do RISC V instructions work correctly in the secure RISC V processor? And what formal tools are doing is because we are not constraining the debug, the stall, or interrupt and exceptions to not happen, so we're driving them freely in formal, it's a stimulus free environment, it forces the design to get the processor to go into a state very quickly, which happens to then raise a failure for one of these checks. 
So the magic is actually in the way the stimulus-free environment of formal is able to force these interactions to happen very quickly is the exact opposite of the test space because in the test space you start bottom up, but as we are kind of doing top down if you want to look at it that way. Another thing that's in motion here is there's extensions that are being issued all the time too, right? How do those play into this? Yeah, exactly. So what happened in this case, let me tell you. So we raised a ticket, uh, and this is available on GitHub on the Cherry OT IBEX uh, page. So we filed a ticket to say the R-type instructions don't work correctly, and the designers then applied a patch to the design. And in fact, we were also able to prove in formal that if we were to disable the uh, illegal exceptions and informal is pretty easy uh, to do this kind of environment constraining. We, we saw that the processor was able to work correctly despite the issue with the illegal cherry load. So when the designers patched the design, we rerun the properties and lo and behold, all of these now turn out to be correct. So the R type were working correctly. Interestingly, the magic of formal again, the bit manipulation properties started to fail and here is where the extensions come into the picture. So what happens is that, so, so the thing is quite complex here. So you have got extensions, then you've got the ones that have been ratified and the ones that have not been ratified by the RISC-V Foundation. So this team was actually using the non-ratified version of the custom uh, instructions. So bit manipulation, an extension to the RISC-V, and now a slightly customized version and the way this was implemented in the processor for multi-cycle bit manipulations meant that certain exceptions could not be trapped correctly. So now we had the other situation that although the R-type instructions were correctly, the bit manipulation ones don't. Did you find any problems with the ratified versions as well? So in this particular implementation, they're not using the ratified one, but I, I think the problem is not so much the ratified versus non-ratified, but what it is is, is how they have implemented the non-ratified and not being able to handle the multi-cycle instructions and exception handling. So it's a very interesting commentary if people go to this GitHub ticket from, from the designers at Microsoft and Low Risk, where they describe why this issue was not caught previously. So there's a lot going on in here. We have built all of this hard work in Cherry to describe what security really needs to be. But by defining those in ISAs and sale models, we're not going to be able to ensure that it is going to be secure downstream. So until we close the whole loop of verification at the architecture and microarchitecture level for the real silicon, nothing is secure. There's a crossover now between security and safety as well. Correct. You think about automotive, that, that if, if something malfunctions, it mm -hmm. could potentially be a security hole. How do you test for that? Because we're dealing with yeah. potentially a shorter life expectancy than what people were expecting uh, for chips operating in, in high ambient temperatures, for example. Yes, sure, excellent. So I think what you're referring to is single event upsets and faults that could actually happen for functional safety. So safety is, is, is a complex topic, right? So one is about systematic verification and being able to use the cores in lockstep mode. That's one aspect of safety. And the other is that if there was a fault that actually happened in real time, is there enough hardware that can actually be used to mask the effect of the fault from propagating to critical assets of the processor? So for that, we use three different things. We have fault injection, fault detection, and fault propagation. So how we can actually do this kind of analysis with formal is amazing. You could start off by simply writing cover properties. The big three EDA companies have apps that can also be used for this. But the interplay of safety with security is quite interesting because what is considered to be a safety problem is mostly like from an automotive point of view, is masking the effect of faults so that they don't affect critical infrastructure. The safety, this going back to the confidentiality, integrity and availability perspective, looks like a separate problem, but actually they could also impact each other. So what is potentially unsafe can also impact security and the other way around. So let's back up here for a second. So if somebody actually wants to use formal, how do they actually go about doing this? What do they have to work into their particular flow? So first thing is understand the domain so we know what the architecture is saying. Second thing with formal is how do we go about modeling those architecture facets? So in the way we have done things at Axiomize is we've created a formal model of the RISC-V architecture and we use formal properties, system catalog assertions. And once they have been coded in one place, 
they can be adapted and configured automatically at runtime for different cores. And that process is quite easy to do, which then allows us to monitor the architectural implementation of each of these cores quite easily. So if you were starting new into formal, what you've got to understand is that writing properties is the easy part because you know what the architecture is saying. Knowing that you've written properties that can actually converge in a formal tool, so the bane of formal proof convergence, is a completely separate challenge. And this is where we find a lot of the people struggling. So they say, we have written a property, but it does not proof. So proof engineering and putting in the infrastructure to actually handle long latency proofs with out of order cores, super scalar cores, this is where actually a lot of the magic is. So of course, we are professionals at this and we've been doing it for a number of years, but for anybody starting new into this, my advice would be um, try to understand how to model good properties in the first place and then ask the question whether this model is complete. Now, there's a whole lot of science behind that as to how we ensure completeness and, 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 show, and ensure that there's no corner case uh, left behind. Uh, but that may be a topic for another day. Ashish Darbari, thanks for a great explanation. Thank you, Ed. Thank you very much.